Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the delegation of the Ismaili Imamat. My name is Sophia Jadavji, and I am a Monitoring Evaluation Research and Learning Manager here at the Aga Khan Foundation Canada. It is a pleasure to have you with us here today, both in person and those who are joining in online. Welcome. For those of you who are here for the first time, the delegation of the Ismaili Imamat was opened in 2008 by His Highness the Aga Khan. Since then, it has been the headquarters of the Aga Khan Foundation Canada. It was opened in the spirit that the space be used to lift our collective horizons how, for how we might all contribute to a more peaceful, prosperous, and pluralist world. It was also the intention of this building to offer new platforms for the exchange of ideas, to stimulate discussion, collaboration, and reflection on Canada's role in the world. Today, I'm excited to be opening the fifth event in our series on measuring development impact. The series was started in February of this year through the support of Global Affairs Canada. The series aims to connect Canadian international development practitioners with global monitoring and evaluation approaches and expertise. Since the beginning, we've had the pleasure of having JPAL speak about randomized control trials. The World Bank speak about social observatory. 3IE speak about conducting impact evaluations in complex environments. And today, we have the pleasure of having Dr. James Copestake, Professor of International Development from the University of Bath, to speak about the qualitative impact protocol. In his presentation on cautionary tales of complex causation, he will speak about the use of QUIP for measuring causation and impact, particularly of climate change and livelihood transformation projects in Africa. Dr. Copestake will present his research and then we will have an opportunity for question, answer and discussion. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. James Copestake. Thank you, uh, Sophia, and uh, it's a terrific pleasure uh, to be here uh, and able to share this talk with you. And, uh, uh, and also, I gather with uh, quite a number of people dotted around Canada and the rest of the world, so welcome to everybody who's here uh, virtually, uh, too. So, um, yes, I'm going to share with you uh, a story which uh, in some ways is very, very pragmatic and very narrow, but I hope will raise all kinds of other interesting issues for you uh, relating to this uh, narrow field of how we assess impact in international development, but to the wider issues of, of causation um, that lurk behind it. And I always start my um, presentations with a nice picture, uh, and usually it's of... Um, Ethiopia or Bolivia or, and I'd like to be able to say that this picture is a stand of Mapani trees somewhere in southern Africa, but I'd be lying. It's, it's, um, it's my cousin's island on Big Rido. And, um, <laughs> so, uh, and it's been a real pleasure to be able to come to Canada and see some of my relatives and uh, <laughs> think, why didn't my dad migrate here 40 years ago? Anyway, um, uh, okay, so enough of that. Um, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to start off by explaining my motivation uh, and framing the talk that I'm going to give you. And then I'm going to be slightly pedantic and, and explain some of my terms because I'm going to use some uh, polysyllabic words which we all probably interpret slightly differently. And then I'm going to tell the story of the development of the QUIP as a protocol, um, the qualitative impact protocol for doing impact evaluation. Uh, and. Uh, some of the things that we came up with which are a bit different from other methodologies. I'm not going to say very much about the substantive findings of the, of, the, of the pilot studies we did, simply because if I did it would take over and this is part of a series of methodological studies. But there is quite, quite a hinterland of uh, substantive issues that the work so far has raised, even though its main intent was methodological. And then I'm going to share a little bit with you um, what we've been doing in the last six months um, by way of trying to mainstream some of these ideas rather than just publishing them and moving on to the next thing. So 
Okay, this is a very full slide, but it's just a way of me setting out my motivation in a series of hopefully um, uh, uh, intelligible um, uh, premises. Firstly, I think understanding causation in international development is really important. Uh, being able to attribute accurately rather than getting away with false claims is really important. So I'm very committed to that evidence agenda, even if we will always do it imperfectly. I also think that most of the time, many agencies assess causation and the impact of their work extremely well um, using common sense and contextualized wisdom and that we underestimate the performance management that goes on within organizations because people are close to the ground and understand their situation well. We underestimate that very much at our peril. And I think social scientists and academics like me have often done a disservice to practice by designing new methodological instruments as if it's a greenfield site, rather than that we're building on what people can find out much more cost-effectively and flexibly for themselves using um, what you know, um, Aristotle called fr phrenesis, you know, contextualized wisdom. So it's all about building on um, that. When that knowledge can lead us astray isn't good enough, and we need a bit more of a reality check um, before we move on in our thinking and our action. Clearly, if we're going to invest in reality checks, in collecting additional evidence, um, uh, it matters very much which methodologies we use um, and um, that we, get the we choose the right horse for the right course. And, um, and I am going to argue, despite my background as an economist, that too often we jump to measurement and we think that quantitative is best, which um, may lead us to try and run before we can walk. And, uh, so I'm going to tell a story of, of, of my attempt to um, change my own orientation a bit and work in the field of qualitative impact assessment. And part of the reason for that is we have this problem that Andrew Natsios, who headed up USAID for many years, describes as obsessive measurement disorder. Um, a lot of us will recognize it. Survey slavery, you know, spending all your time you know, measuring the pig when it doesn't make it grow any faster, you know. Um, and, um, and that is a real problem. It's running before we can walk in many cases where, particularly in complex contexts, we're trying to do very difficult things anyway. And so um, I feel that there is a, an imbalance at the moment um, that, uh, that maybe it's because quantitative approaches ha have received a lot more investment, a lot brighter minds, um, they're more intelligible to certain sorts of people. Um, and I feel there is a bit of an imbalance. And so part of my mission at the moment is to, is to try and rectify that uh, a little bit. Um, but at the same time, I don't think qualitative methods as developed in infinite detail and complexity by social scientists um, often uh, help themselves. There's an awful lot of lack of clarity, um, obfuscation goes on. So um, if we could sort of inject a little bit more transparency and, and clarity into thinking about qualitative methods, I think that would help to build the bridges and recognize how um, different methods, more quantitative, more qualitative, work together and can work together. And um, this problem with qualitative research, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Akerlof's lemon problem. Akerlof, the Nobel Prize winning economist, observed that lots of second-hand cars never get sold even though they're perfectly good. It's the lemon problem. Why? Because it costs too much to check out whether there's some glitch in them, which is going to become painfully obvious at one kilometer down the road after you've bought it. Yeah? And I think that can be a bit true with qualitative impact evaluation. You don't know which is a good method and which is a bad one, which is a good consultancy firm, which is a bad one. Um, so people end up not using it, because it's too difficult to decide whether you're going to get value for money. Um, in terms of using those methods as a, as a supplementary reality check. Okay. And so what's my bid in this field to try and shed a bit of light on it? Well, was to brazenly go out and develop a method for ourselves 
uh, and try and do it quite methodically and carefully and document it well, and then put it out there and see whether that helps other people um, to understand. And I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. Um, this idea of benchmarks is maybe closer to brands. You know, we're constantly having to choose between immense numbers of very complicated products. You know, think of the last time you bought a vacuum cleaner. Yeah? And if there are a few iconic products on the market, it helps. Even if you don't buy the iPod or the Dyson Hoover or whatever it is, you know what a good product looks like because that, that brand has become familiar. So what I thought we would do was work with some organizations, develop a qualitative impact evaluation protocol, not because we think it's going to be you know, the iPhone, uh, but because hopefully that will illuminate what is and is not useful qualitative evaluation. So that's my motivation. That's the, the framing of this talk. And I'm now going to do the academic bit and just clarify some of the terms that I've already slipped in um, a little bit. The first one, attribution. Uh, very simply, if we're a development agency or an impact investor uh, and we are uh, carrying out some activity X to try and change people's livelihoods, and the livelihood bit, the reason we chose to work on climate change and, and livelihood adaptation in Africa was, you know, we can crack that one. It should be useful in lots of other contexts too. So we deliberately went out and took a difficult case. So if we're trying to do something in a complex environment, um, to improve people's well-being or nutrition or uh, whatever our goals are, um, we know that it's subject to lots of contextual variables, Z. How do we decide whether X is contributing to a change in Y? How do we solve the attribution problem? Well, a lot of people say the only way you can do that was the counterfactual. Yeah? Will you do it by having a treatment and a control group or exposure variation? Um, to the treatment across a, a population and inferring statistically what the impact of something you're trying to control or quasi-controlling is controlling for all the other factors. Now, I've got no problem with that. It's very clear. Statistical inference is a very powerful thing. It's just very difficult in very complex and fast-changing environments. So the question is, rather than me criticizing the randomistas, what do you do when you can't do an RCT? And that was the question we set ourselves. And also, there was a little bit of wanting to rescue what I call self-reported attribution, which is sometimes when you've got a difficult problem, you go and ask the person who's at the center of it what they think is, is driving change. So what I call self, um, um, uh, self-reported attribution. Um, there are some standard criticisms of that. People will just tell you what you want to know. It's not always true. But it is, a, it is, a, it is a, an issue that we're going to have to uh, tackle at some stage if we're going to convince people. OK. Credibility. The point here is that, um, yeah, we want to be as rigorous as we can in terms of um, generating good enough argument and evidence to enable us to convince somebody else that Rx is causing a change in Y subject to Z, and to do that in a transparent way so um, uh, they know that, yes, it may work in certain circumstances, but it may not work in others. So we're aspiring to that. Um, and critically to the scientific method, it's also about we're doing that in a way which is subject to peer review, you know, the neglected aspect of rigor. Um, but I'm not making claims to scientific absolutes and universals here. My concern in, you know, in difficult environments where there are hugely complex problems to be t solved is good enough. It's what McGilchrist, a uh, neuroscientist at, the, uh, at Oxford, refers to as reasonable rather than rational. You know, what is the good enough way of getting the feedback, the, re the reality check we need to stop ourselves doing stupid things when it's apparent that, that maybe our mental models, our ways of thinking, our good practice are running in the wrong direction, which of course they can do big time. So that's the world that I'm in. Um, credible causation, what do I mean by causation? Well, you'll see I've got quite a, 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 a specific definition here. Let's go out and let's find out whether X and Y are actually happening. Are farmers' yields going up? Are they getting more seed if we're trying to raise yields through better seeds? Yeah? I'm going to say X was a cause of Y if a lot of people plausibly tell me that they think it was. Self-reported attribution. Yeah? So there's my definition of causation. Yeah? 
Is there, is there a counterfactual there? Well, there's a kind of implicit counterfactual. They're using the language, you know, language to say, to, 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 to have a, 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 um, um, a, a conditional. And we, we've got conditionals in the language. Let's use them. Yeah? Um, so there is a sort of counterfactual there. It's just not explicit. Um, and yes, we want to be sure that there isn't some better explanation for why they might say that. Yeah? We want to test that particular um, or explore that particular alternative hypothesis. And, um, and also, yes, if lots of people tell us that X causes Y, it does add to um, credibility of that causal claim if we've got a good theory to explain why that might be so. Yeah? We can understand at least the possible mechanism. So, you know, that isn't scientific rigor, you may say, but that's good enough for me. If we can generate evidence to fit that, I'm happy. Okay, last one of, this, uh, of the terms, complex contexts. <clears throat> there are lots of definitions of, of complexity, but I'm particularly interested in um, these Zs, these conditioning factors that influence the relationship between two, any, any two variables, which are always different. Even if you're talking about the same agency in the same place, the date's changed, okay? So what's the problem if you're trying to um, uh, raise the amount of malt barley you can buy from Ethiopian farmers um, in southern Ethiopia? Well, um, all the contextual factors are difficult to identify. There are many of them that affect yields, that affect your competitive edge in the marketplace, that might be distracting farmers to doing other things. It's often hard to measure all those things accurately. Um, their effects are, are interactive and cumulative. You know, we, actually modeling them is very difficult because there are so many interactions and cumulative um, feedback loops. And can we control all those things? Well, sometimes, but it's often very, very difficult um, <clears throat> to, to control all those additional factors influencing our, our, our link between X and, uh, and Y. So we've got a complex problem. And now I'm going to tell you a story of one attempt to produce something which was good enough. The first thing we did <coughs> was identify the people to work with. And the, the art project, which um, ran for four years, funded by the UK government through the Economic and Social Research Council and the Department for International Development, the art project was a collaboration between the University of Bath and three NGOs, one specialized in impact evaluation and two specialized in promoting uh, livelihood change in Africa, farm Africa and self-help Africa. And they just got a load of money from DFID to fund their core funding. And DFID had said, we'll give you this money, but we want you to up your game in terms of um, impact evaluation. Not an unfamiliar story, um, I think, for people who take money from governments, in my experience, including academics. Um, so <clears throat> we started a conversation. They said, how are we going to do this? Um, we, 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 we're not sure. So we said, well, let's, let's work together, uh, run an action research program, and see if we can come up with something. And so the goals of the action research were to design and pilot uh, um, <clears throat> a credible, timely, and cost-effective qualitative impact protocol in the, complex, in the context of complex rural transformations. Um, including climate change, but also the, 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 the very rapid pace of urbanization and commercialization taking place across Africa. And there was something more. Yes, the organizations were concerned to confirm that they were doing what they hoped they were doing, that their theory of change was accurate and was working on the ground. But also, I was worried that a lot of the qualitative work was focusing on validating, confirming theories of change and was blinkering us so that we only saw what we wanted to see. So how could we keep the exploratory research side into um, the, the field work that we might do? And of course, how could we do that so that we complemented the ongoing monitoring, performance management, learning, observation that was taking place within the organization anyway, rather than pretending it didn't exist? So, um, and here broadly are our X, Ys, and Zs to, to make it tangible. The, the collaborating NGOs chose four projects for us to pilot our studies on, two in Malawi and two in Ethiopia. Two were broadly multiple strand, multiple component uh, livelihood programs with a bit of beekeeping and irrigation, small scale, uh, small livestock uh, tailored to different sorts of clients. 
um, in northern Tigray um, and um, in northern Malawi. Uh, and, um, and two of the programs were more specialized value chain enhancement programs, one uh, malt barley, um, uh, because of course the, the market for commercial beer in Africa is growing very, very fast. And who supplies that market makes a difference. And Ethiopia is currently importing 40% more of its malt barley, which is a travesty, yeah. given that it's landlocked and it has some great barley growing areas. Yeah? So value chain enhancement, not just international value chains, often for domestic markets. And in Ethiopia, in Malawi, it was, it, it was um, ground nut. So these NGOs were doing lots of things to try and strengthen the livelihoods of farmers in selected areas in the two countries. Um, they wanted to raise food production, cash income, food consumption, et cetera, et cetera. Those are all our whys, our domains, our outcome domains. And there was lots of noise. There was lots of complexity. Weather, crop pests, other organizations working in the same area, market conditions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So a complex problem. How do we validate the, 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 the contribution of X to Y, given all those Zs going on? So we started with a workshop. Um, in which we put together a plan for how we would um, carry out an impact evaluation within the broad constraints that the NGOs were already working with, which was flying someone expensively from places like Bath and Ottawa uh, down to their project areas to interview a few farmers and write a report. Yeah? So within that budget constraint and within you know, a week or two, could we design something which would be more useful to them as a reality check? That was, that was the broad um, uh, trend. And we deliberately chose four projects where there was ongoing monitoring going on so that we could compare what farmers told us about causation with what we observed through other mechanisms about the changes that were taking place between a baseline and an end line two years apart. Um, we, 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 we did two rounds of, 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 of testing and, and adapting the QIP and then at the end of the, of the program um, we had a lot of fun in terms of um, presenting back the findings to the, to, the, to the field staff and other stakeholders. And I'll talk at the end. Uh, we've also now asked ourselves, can what we've learned be shared and applied and emulated in other fields? OK, um, so what's this quip that I keep banging on about? Um, I'm going to briefly run through it in three steps how we collect the data, how we analyze it, and how we use it, OK? And I'm not going to be able to go into all the detail. We could spend the next two hours talking about sampling issues and why representative sampling, rather than sampling positive deviance, may or may not be the best way of adding to the, the credibility of our understanding. Um, so sampling is one issue. Um, the whole issue of recruiting um, the field staff is a much more important one. Uh, how do we find good staff who really can, can establish that relationship of respect and mutual understanding with the respondents so that the quality of the data, the narratives, the self-reported attribution is good? You know, that's the big one. No matter what the protocol looks like, it's about having good field staff who, who know how to talk to people properly. And, um, but we've got this blinding problem. And so the thing that's probably attracted quite a lot of attention with the QIP uh, so far as, as I've uh, promoted it is that we thought we've got to tackle this one head on. So we started experimenting with recruiting local researchers, ideally from the university closest to the field area. So McKelly for the Tigray project, Ambo for Oromia, the University of Malawi um, for, for both central and northern Malawi, recruiting local researchers, sending them to the field, to talk to farmers without telling them who they were evaluating. <clears throat> so we blinded them. I prefer to say blindfolding, because then it's not so permanent. Um, <clears throat> and, and our research co colleagues uh, in those universities, they immediately knew what we were doing, because they had a sort of social anthropology background. They liked the idea of open-ended research. So being told to go and talk to a bunch of farmers about how their livelihood has changed over the last two or three years um, in a broad way was something they, you know, they, were, they were happy to do. And they understood, um, of course, that if that could increase the credibility of the narratives they then wrote down and sent back to us, then it would make the whole thing more mean, meaningful. So you know, not, not totally straightforward, and we can talk about that in questions, to, to go into the field without saying, I'm from Oxfam, you know, um, and will you answer my questions? 
But the advantage is that that blindfolding will add to the credibility of the stories that we collect. So we thought we'd give it a go. And surprisingly, there's not much um, uh, literature on doing that in qualitative research. Um, so we used semi-structured interviews in which the respondent was talked through different outcome domains, their crops, their income, other sources of income, um, nutrition, and asked what were the major things that had changed between now and a specified period in the past, which we anchored on some experience in their own lives, you know, when their children left home or when they had a last baby or whatever. So what has changed in your crop production over the last two years since your, la your, your daughter went to the Middle East or whatever it was? Okay. Um, <clears throat> and we followed that up with focus groups because we found that focus groups of young men, young women, older men and older women separately generated different sorts of feedback, different sorts of stories, more generalized, but with people less inhibited by being in their own household. Um, <clears throat> and so it was a series of open-ended conversations with closed questions punctuating it just to check, okay, we've talked about your crops overall, is your crop production better or worse than it was two years ago? Just to end the conversation and have a few closed questions uh, in which the respondent was able to, uh, as it were, sum up whether it was positive or negative. And, um, and then our field team wrote down, they recorded the, the, the narratives, and they wrote down transcripts onto an Excel spreadsheet, and they sent, us, sent those to us. Very simple. And they were happy because then they got paid and they didn't have to wait to get paid um, uh, until they'd written some report in English or, you know, which um, was an unknown because they didn't know quite what the person wanted at the other end of the contract. So here's the choreography I've just described, and you note the key thing here is we've got our commissioner at the top who wants the reality check. They are funding a service provider doing things in the field. As the lead impact researcher, and under the pilot project, the art project that was us at the University of Bath, we act as a kind of firewall because we're collecting data from our commissioning organization and giving it to our colleagues in the field as a way of preventing them from knowing who the client is. And the other reason for that is the clients supplied us with lists of people they thought were beneficiaries of their work. So we were reducing the probability that the field team were going out and weren't going to find anybody who had anything to do with the project we were evaluating. We knew, and in the best cases, it was a bit variable, but in the best cases, we knew that the farmer they were interviewing had received seed for two years, had attended some training, had um, been a member of the co-op that was doing the marketing. So that bit of the theory of change we had solid. And the question was, in an open conversation, unprompted by any reference to the project, what would they say? That was, the, that was the strategy. So we move on to analysis, and some of you will know that the problem with qualitative in, in, interviewing often is you generate rich data, wonderful stories, very powerful, pages of them, you know, particularly if you transcribe everything, which we didn't um, because we were relying on the, 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 the summaries of, of our researchers. So what do you do with all that data? And the answer is you have to, do, you have to code it in some way in order that it can be sorted and reviewed by someone who hasn't got time to read 60 pages of, of open-ended text. And I think probably the second thing we did, which was a bit different, was we didn't just code according to the key drivers of change, got seed, drought, uh, wh you know, whatever came up most often in all the transcripts and got coded in the Excel sheets. Um, we coded according to our perception of the value of the data for explaining causation credibly. And what do I mean by that? I mean that the sort of golden bullet was where I went up and I talked to you and I said, how did you learn so much about impact evaluation? And you said, well, I went to this lecture by James Copestake at the Aga Khan. Yeah? So solid evidence. If, if you were asked that question without thinking that the person asking you knew anything about this lecture, yeah. So likewise, if we ask a farmer, okay, why has your crop production gone up? And they mention Farm Africa. Well, it's what we call smoking gun evidence. You know, it's unsolicited, explicit narrative statement. And if we get several of those, that's beginning to look like causation according to my definition. Yeah. And the text that gets coded as explicit is there in the appendix to the report. You don't have to read it all, but you can go there if you want to, as we'll see. 
Yeah? So explicit evidence is the best thing, and of course the negative explicit is really interesting when we get to the next stage. Um, and then there's also implicit, which is, yes, I, you know, I got some improved seed, I don't know who it was from, but as a result my yields went up a little bit. So they don't name the organization, but it's consistent with the theory of change. And that's why the coder, the analyst, has to be different from the person collecting the data, because the coder knows the theory of change, it can code according to whether the evidence is explicit, implicit, or, quite a lot of it, incidental. Actually, the project was nothing to do with the major drivers of change in my life. There are all sorts of other things going on, by the way, yeah? um, the incidental evidence, which is also obviously very useful as a reality check, and means we're open to the unanticipated causes as well as the unintended consequences. Okay, how am I doing for time? I'm probably... Um... Okay, so here's a few examples of what the reports do. We, we were lucky to team up with a local company um, that, that just do Excel spreadsheets well. And they said, don't worry about fancy qualitative analysis software. We will, we will enable you to do what you want to do with Excel using macros and then formulae. Um, so we generate a table for our country director who's reading this report, which just says, okay, here are the people we interviewed down on the left. Some are men, some are women. We asked them about changes in their lives across six domains, food production, cash income. And at the end of those conversations, we asked a closed question, better, worse, the same. And there's the story. We've got roughly half of the respondents pretty positive. Things are getting better for them across a whole series of domains in their own judgment. Yeah? Some getting worse. So we're not hiding behind averages here. This is qualitative research. You can see each individual. You can identify whether they're older, younger, male, female. Um, we're interested in differentiated stories, not one aggregate story of a typical farmer. So that's the closed data. The open data is coded like this. What we've got here is the domains again now down the left hand side and we've got our three categories of evidence across explicit, implicit, other, and the codes show how many farmers said something that got coded as, take the top left-hand cell, as po project explicit positive evidence of increased food production. So in this case, we've got five farmers, all in KM, which is one of the, one of the two clustered um, villages where the sampling was done, um, and we've got two focus groups who had, uh, you know, we had smoking gun evidence. So you know, if, if you wonder why that code is there, you can go back and read the transcript and see what they actually said. You can audit it. It's, trans it's transparent. But on the whole, this is a story which is pretty positive. I, I don't think I've printed out the negative one, but there was a lot more positive explicit than negative explicit with this particular pilot, which was Masumbankunda in, Ma in Malawi. And, um, and the idea of this is that our, our users can look at this and at a snapshot they get some sense of what the story is. There's lots of detail but they can begin to get a sense of what the story is and if they want more they can go back to the original transcript and they can read what KM1 said about the increase in food production. And it may be us as analysts or ideally it's one of their own staff who is doing the coding so they've read the whole lot and they've really got a sense of what's going on because they've done the coding without having to fly to the country if they're in Dublin or Ottawa or wherever. And on the right, we also coded by drivers of change. In this case, Self-Help Africa's training and seed credit. This particular text was also coded um, according to those two drivers of change, so that in addition to the coding of the quality of the evidence, we've got um, coding of what it is down the left that is, um, is being reported as a positive driver of change. And you'll see we've got things which are clearly about the project, the training. And it was nice to see training coming through positive along with the material inputs. A lot of field staff complain that the preoccupation is with the, the material inputs and the training doesn't get mentioned. But with, with the quip, we found often training did get talked about by, by farmers. Um, gender training there as well. You'll notice God gets a look in as having a positive impact on my crop production. Um, and, uh, and on relationships within the village and between households, um, et cetera. So village savings and, focus and loan groups, that was interesting. That wasn't part of this project. 
So it was something else going on. Another development agency in the, in the area were running VSLAs. And we got quite a lot of interesting evidence about the effect of that. Of course, the next layer is then to start looking at the interaction effects of the different drivers and, and starting to model those uh, and compare it with the modeling we did when we came up with the theory of change that, 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 that was behind the design of the intervention in the first place. So you get the idea, yeah? Um, and, um, and I could obviously elaborate further, um, but let me move on to use. The first thing I've already mentioned, which was involving, if we're doing this with organizations with growing hierarchies because they're trying to go to scale, then involving people higher up the hierarchy in doing the analysis, we found it, it internalized the learning within the organization and enabled people in one country to get an insight into what farmers were saying about the pro programs of the same organization somewhere else. So building internal dialogue um, within the organization. Um, we had great fun unblindfolding our field team and then arranging meetings for them with the, the program staff. Because one of the things that the NGOs liked was their program staff weren't involved at all in the data collection. So we didn't tie them up doing the M&E because our researchers went in completely independently. But of course, they wanted to know the results. And it was great fun to sit there and see them looking at the report together. And if you've got a negative explicit finding, like that the groundnut sheller was located in the, in the wrong place, um, then the staff were there to defend themselves um, and to say, yeah, well, it was impossible to choose the right place because you know, somebody was going to be disappointed or, or, or whatever the story was. So those meetings were often very useful and powerful learning lessons in themselves. And the Malawians, as some of you will know, have a subsidized fertilizer program, which has created lots of ghost villages. Because you know, if you have fictional people in the village, they're entitled to coupons of fertilizer. And indeed, we have ghost villages in Malawi where um, the same people are registered by two headmen or in two administrations in order that they can both get the fertilizer coupons. So the idea of having ghost researchers was um, the source of a lot of hilarity um, uh, among the participants in these meetings. Um, so OK, we triangulate against other sources of information. That's really important. And then hopefully it gets fed into evidence internally, keeping DFID happy. Got to keep the external donor happy as well. But most important, you know, was this challenging the operational theories, the mental models that was behind the intervention? Part of my motivation for this was years of working in microfinance and failing to convince micro, micro credit organizations that actually they weren't reducing poverty nearly as much as they thought they were. And it was an incredibly difficult mental model to shift once it came to be believed. OK. So, um, so feeding into those internal understandings, because you've been sufficiently open to commission some research that tells you a few things which aren't predetermined by your prior thinking. Um, and, um, and one of the nice things about the QIP is obviously there's a minimum size you need if you're doing experimental or quasi-experimental impact evaluation by statistical inference because of the power you need to, um, to compare your, your treatment and control groups. With the QUIP, every interview stands on its own. It's kind of got granular integrity. So if you do 10 QUIPs and you're getting the same story that the malt barley farmers are happy, why do more? Yeah, as long as you've got the sampling right. But if you're getting lots of different stories, go out and do some more. So one can be more incremental. Um, and uh, that goes back to my motivation about finding ways of of feeding back good intelligence flexibly so that our programming can be flexible. So um, those are a few of the, the things that come out in the, in the use. And I should say, like probably every research project, our prior thinking was very heavy on data collection, not so heavy on analysis, and not so heavy on use. And we ended up probably spending more time uh, and effort working on the use and the analysis than with the data collection. We thought we kind of finished when we designed the protocol. And we hadn't started. Um, so anyway, is this, is this all reinventing the wheel or not? Um, there's actually quite a lot of interest in qualitative impact evaluation at the moment. And some of this we read beforehand and tried to internalize in the design process five years ago. But it's moved on. Um, and my answer is, yeah, the, the quip actually is not, it's not some, I'm not saying this is some unique new. It's just a brand of qualitative impact evaluation has a lot in common with John Main's um, development of contribution analysis. Um, 
He emphasizes particularly clear specification of the claims we're making and the theory behind it in order to be clear what we're trying to validate or to refute. He es estimates then going out and gathering appropriate evidence. Contribution analysis, a weakness, as with the quip, we rarely can measure the, the magnitude of the impact. We're, we're estimating causal patterns, but rarely can we actually quantify them. We might be able to do that through simulation, through micro simulation, particularly if we've got good monitoring data to go with it. But, you know, so it's contribution analysis is strictly rather than impact assessment if you want to be picky. Um, and um, lots of John Main, lots of triangulation. Go back and, and check your, your theory. Um, so I'm making no claim that QIP is anything other than an example worked out of contribution analysis. Okay. Realist evaluation, Ray Pawson, there are various other versions of this. Um, uh, well, I think we've got a lot in common with realist evaluation, too. Ray's great thing is what works for whom in what circumstance. In other words, just because you've done an RCT, it tells you that in that case, at that time in history, you know, more flip charts improved educational outcome. doesn't mean it will happen anywhere else. So realist evaluation is how do we collect understanding evidence on what works and why in what circumstances. Yeah, we've gone beyond that a little bit. We're also about when and who knows, but I'll come back to that. Complexity ontology, what do I mean by that? Um, what I mean by that is that, you know, the debate in impact evaluation is often, you know, about positivists looking for absolute truth, that we can model the whole system to a very high degree versus the, you know, the hardcore social scientists who deny that we can ever know anything except, you know, subjectively and in relative terms. And realism says the truth is hidden, it's very, very complicated, so we're always struggling to keep up and catch up, but it doesn't mean to say there isn't truth. And I'm pretty comfortable with that. So I'm, I guess I'm a realist. And I don't want to be called either a positivist or a constructivist. I want to be called a realist. Which means that I'm constantly aware that we, you know, we're getting better, we're learning more, but we're not quite there, and we might well be deluding ourselves. Um, which takes us to the next point um, uh, that, that, that realist evaluators emphasize, is this idea of institutionalizing distrust. Yeah? My, um, my uncle, who emigrated to Canada and became a professor of medicine, just not very far from here, um, he, um, he, um, he used to say, never give up on your doubt. Um, and, um, and I hope I've, uh, it's a pity he's not here, he's long dead, but uh, uh, to, uh, to, to take me up on, on that at the end of this lecture, which I'm sure he would. Um, so organized distrust, the peer review, the chance to have the unblinded meetings, uh, and so on, um, and the emphasis on, um, for the realist evaluators, the key thing is you've got an explanatory theory behind what you're doing, and you're generating evidence to interrogate that theory. Um, uh, and, and particularly what they call CMO configurations, which is every theory has a context, has an implicit mechanism by which something is changing in, usually through cognitive processes in the heads of people, which leads to an outcome. So what are we doing with all this reality check stuff? We are testing our CMO configurations. Every interview is generating narrative stories of change, which are a CMO configuration. They're saying, this outcome happened because of this mechanism. I went to some training, and I started thinking about the way I used to treat my wife yeah, in the context where lots of other people were also receiving that training, and there was a social norm being challenged. And, so, and if you remember, I put a table up of four projects, a whole set of outcomes, and a whole set of contexts which was the pilot project. Well, it's about not just listing them, it's about saying it's these particular treatments, these particular Xs, and these particular Zs are leading to these particular Ys. And the more we get at that, the more we build explanatory theory. So what are we doing in impact evaluation? We are testing, challenging, augmenting the explanatory theory that leads into our theories of change, which drives the design of the different interventions that we're taking. So again, I'm with the, evalu the realists on this one. Um, 
I'll skip the next point, but very interestingly, the Journal of Evaluation has recently carried an interview about realist interviewing, which emphasizes that for realists, the interview is a sharing of your theories with the respondent. Open, transparent, this is what I think is happening, what do you think is happening? So actually, it's almost the antithesis of the blinding that we've been experimenting with. So I'm looking forward to lots of debates about the pros and cons. And I'm not saying that one always has to blind. I'm saying it's been an interesting experiment and an interesting way um, of, of learning about that problem of confirmatory bias. Right, OK, I'm getting there. So my third comparison with another method is process tracing. And, and a young UK consultant academic to look out for is Barbara Buffani, who is working on, on this stuff um, as a consultant attached to the University of East Anglia. Um, process tracing, um, one of the things I like about process tracing is they say, give as much effort to the alternative theories that might be driving your outcome Y as to the one that you think is happening, your own treatment or, or, or intervention. Um, and of course, the quip by blinding does that because we are giving no weight to the theories of change that the project wants us to find out about relative to whatever else the farmer may say is a major driver of change. So I think we tick that box for the process tracers. We've also adopted their language because process tracing is about saying what, um, uh, what was, an, you know, trying to identify smoking gun evidence um, of the drivers of change and hoop, hoop test evidence. So that's language, the explicit implicit is, is language we've borrowed from process tracing, which comes from political science. And um, process tracing is also very explicit about you're never going to know everything, so you have to decide when is, a de when is enough evidence enough, um, which again, I think, e um, echoes what we're doing. And what Barbara Buffani is doing at the moment is bringing Bayesian more rigorous Bayesian statistics to bear in terms of saying, okay, in some situations you can state your prior. I'm 90% confident we caused this. I'm 50% confident or neutral that um, this legislation would have, wouldn't have happened without that campaign. And then you go out and you collect evidence and you score how much that improves your confidence above your prior. And that's the thinking, I think, behind the quip and a lot of qualitative impact evaluation. Um, is, you know, is augmenting the evidence base until we're co confident enough, credible enough, rather than starting with a, um, uh, you know, a greenfield site. Um, so I think we've got quite a lot in common with, with, um, with, with process tracing. Um, and, um, but I think, you know, holding on to that exploratory bit is one of the things we do. So here's a table I've plagiarized from Barbara Buffani and colleagues and is on the Bond website, the, which is the umbrella body of UK NGOs in development. And what it shows is her beginning to construct a sort of decision tool, listing all the different tools, and these aren't all of them that she's been reviewing, um, including RCTs, Realist, Process Tracing, Contribution Analysis, the Quip, and saying, OK, um, which one you choose partly depends upon the question you've got. Are you interested in how big the overall change caused by the intervention was, the magnitude, in which case an RCT can measure that very accurately, whereas these other methods are not very good at measuring the magnitude of the change. They might help you do better simulation, but that's about as far as it's going to go. So clearly, the RCT has many strengths if the problem is narrowly specified enough that you can estimate the magnitude. But let's go to three. How and why did it make a difference? Well, an expert group ranked RCTs two there and gave the methods we've been discussing five. So let's forget about gold standards. Yeah? It's gold standards for a particular purpose, for a particular context that we're talking about, not an absolute gold standard, which is, which is just positivist heresy in the social science, blinding people with science. Okay, so there's lots more on that website, which is really good um, stuff. Um, okay, um, I said I wouldn't have time for substantive findings, and I haven't because this is a series about methodology, but I can't resist at least one point, which is that um, our four studies and the ones we've done since certainly confirm our, our prior that we're dealing with extremely complex processes of change, um, where, yes, 
not all, but many of the farmers we talked to understood the context better than we did, of course, yeah? Um, and it wasn't, it's not a linear process. There's not a one-stop shot you can do and suddenly a farmer moves from being non-resilient to resilient. Um, and indeed, um, it's all about, you know, the, the, and we haven't fully written this up yet, but the extraordinary diversity of trajectories that farmers were on. And they weren't all on a single linear trajectory towards being more diversified in order to enhance their resilience. For some, specializing was the best strategy with secure relationships for a period. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's not surprising that some NGOs are busy strengthening farmers' positions within secure value chains by strengthening their relationships and their market power, while others are encouraging them to diversify so they're not so dependent on any one. It's complicated. It's very, very complicated. And we need lots and lots of rethinking and adjustment and flexibility as market conditions change, which obviously create risks that self-sufficient farmers didn't have, even if they had more risks in other ways. Um, so beware what James Scott called thin simplifications. You know, the grand narrative driving the fashions in development, um, which I hope better and more appropriate evidence can help to be an antidote towards. Um, so, and then very last slide. Um, I've sort of had a career of five-year plans. I embark on a bit of research. Uh, you work at it. You get immersed. You build the networks. Then you run out of steam and you start sounding like a record player. You're just saying the same thing over and over again. So it's time to move on. Um, with the quip work, um, I was lucky to have a very inspiring research officer, Fiona Remnant, who said to me, she said, the thing we should do now is set up a company. And you can get support to be a startup company in a university. So in, in April, we formed Bath Social and Development Research Limited to promote the quip, which immediately, of course, tarnishes everything I've said, because you now know that I have a vested interest. Um, <laughs> in promoting it. It's a non-profit company. We just want to see how far it goes and explore how we can contribute to this sector. So, and that's why we made it a non-profit company. But it is a mechanism for working around some of the university bureaucracy um, and hopefully being a little bit more uh, fleet of foot and agile in, in, in promoting this kind of, of work. And um, so with NGOs, we got repeat business from Gorta Self Help Africa to look at their cassava commercialization in Kenya. Um, Oxfam GB commissioned us this summer to look at the gender impacts of some of their work with fair trade coffee co ops in southern Ethiopia. Um, we're doing a very interesting project now um, on a community development program, a sort of a frarian um, social transformation program um, in Uganda with a faith based organization. And um, one of my um, colleagues is in India um, looking at microfinance for slum upgrading through um, incremental improvements to, to dwellings. So it's, you know, we've, we've got, we've, we, we're on our way. Um, we've also deliberately reached out to impact investors because I think lots of private impact investors are, are, are facing the same question. How do they assess the impact of their work beyond the last hard statistic? Um, what evidence do they need to, to demonstrate that it isn't just positive change, they're not just creating jobs, that's having some kind of uh, attributable impact. And so we're doing some work uh, with um, a big brewery in, in Ethiopia on the malt barley chain. Again, some dairy, small-scale dairy investments in India. And um, in some ways, most excitingly of all, the foundation attached to a large ready-made garment manufacturer has commissioned us to do a blinded study of labor standards uh, in a number of factories on the Mexican-US border are the things they're doing to try and promote better working conditions, working or not, through interviewing um, employees in their homes. Um, so those are some of the things that are ongoing. Um, and um, DFID have been very supportive of us, still are. And we're also thinking about um, what we can do to promote this field of practice, um, both through, um, as it were, laying down this challenge. Here's a benchmark. This is how we do qualitative impact evaluation. May not be right for you. It may not be optimal or whatever, but at least it's fairly transparent. So over to you. You know, adapt it. Great. 
Um, so building a brand very deliberately as a, as a, as a dissemination strategy. Um, and, um, and also working on trying to build a network of the colleagues that we're um, uh, now, um, who are now familiar with, with what we're doing um, in the different countries that we've been working. So um, there we go. Um, and uh, I think I should stop now and, uh, and, and open it up to, to questions. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, John Verdun. This was, was quite wonderful. So I'm, I'm wondering uh, what I really appreciate is the appreciation of complexity and the sense that, and the realist position that in this situation, in this time, under these particularities, this is what worked. And so this seems to me to be shifting, uh, pr representing a shift in the larger approach to science and certainly social science around not develop, um, developing a model that will predict, but re developing an ongoing mechanism to monitor. For example, our improvements over weather forecasting is less about our math of how things work and more about the area that we can actually see in real time. And so some of this seems to me to imply the need to build these mechanisms as a, um, because there will be no final solution. There's always just solutioning and that this ongoing feedback allows ongoing adaptation to complex changing situations. And, and so for me, this seems like a really good movement. And how could you take this and move it into a, a sphere of big data, right? What sorts of sensors, what sorts of, uh, of apps, right? What's, how can you bring this into people's daily life mm -hmm. in, in a way that allows that information to be collected and portrayed so that uh, Okay. Um, I think that was mostly a comment which I wholeheartedly agree with, but just one quick rider, the big data point. Of course, you know, big data, um, well, some big data analysts say they're not interested in causation. You know, yeah. just look at the correlation. But actually, for me, you know, if big data is one way of doing really good monitoring and picking up trends, and much of the time, that's good enough, but occasionally something is thrown up by the big data that you don't understand, then you need the fire brigade to go out and check why the smoke alarm went off. And that's the way I think about the quip. You know, a lot of the time, programs are running, people on the ground know what's going on, but if up the hierarchy, you need something to, there's a reality check. The um, uh, Diageo, who's our client in, in Ethiopia, and, and as you know, is a big whiskey um, producer as well as owning Guinness, they call them deep dives. And when I talked to their head of co corporate social responsibility, he didn't want to hear about monitoring. The language was different. He said, yeah, but we could do with a deep dive. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I have two practical questions. Number one, I was delighted to hear that you do triangulation and find other evidence, because in terms of the uh, environmental impact assessment, that's very essential. The other point that I wanted to ask for clarification, when you are blindfolding the uh, uh, field workers, does that create a bias? Because they are not able to have uh, probing questions that would be able to help us to better uh, quantify the explicit or implicit values that you're looking for. Yeah. Thank you. Um, indeed, the, um, the, the blindfolding is, you know, it's double-edged. There are trade-offs involved in it. Um, and, um, you know, our lead researcher in, in, from Mekele in Tigre, Moses Bile, you know, he, part of his feedback was that uh, as a good social scientist, he was frustrated that if he'd known more about the project, he could have, he said, I could have told you some even more interesting things um, and I'm sure he, he could have done, and he would have, um, you know, he's experienced enough to be sensitive about the way he introduced himself and to mitigate the potential biases from being introduced more explicitly as evaluating that project. So 
I'm, I'm, not, I'm not kind of riding for a debate with the realists about you know, how much blinding is necessary, but it has been very useful, I think, in opening a conversation with, as I say, particularly some of the, my colleagues in economics and health who are very skeptical about self-reported attribution. We needed some way of saying, well, actually, if you're worried about that, we can find ways of, 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 of dealing, mitigating some of those biases. Um, so, yeah, it comes at a bit of a price. And, of course, there's a really interesting negotiation, discussion goes on with the, with the commissioner, because what they don't want to happen is for you to go into the field, talk to a lot of people, have interesting conversations, and give them a report that says nothing you're doing is having any impact on the way they think at all, or what they say. Yeah? So we do want to make the question specific enough that the chance of a smoking, you know, that, that if we don't get some explicit evidence, well, that's a surprise. So it's all about the design of the questions. And as we move from working on farm livelihoods to in other spheres, of course, we're having to change the, the semi-structured questionnaires, the generative questions and the probing questions to suit each one. And what you can do a little bit is start open and exploratory and then move in a little bit more to questions which are signaling what you're interested in um, to make sure that you capture it, but then you give a little, slightly less weight to the questions which are more explicitly. So it's more about experimenting with this, really, than saying there is one uh, right answer. And, um, uh, yeah. Thank you very much. I had a couple of questions um, about your measurements or your scale. So um, first I noticed the time period, it was two years. So I was wondering, I see a lot in um, larger data sets, it's usually in the last 12 months or within the last year. Yeah. So I was wondering, does the two year mark, is that maybe coming in with growing seasons or why was it two instead of three? And then my second question is as um, you use a three point Likert scale. So it was like getting better, the same or not. Um, or not are going mm -hmm. to a negative. So I was just wondering why was it as, um, that instead of say like a five or a ten? Um, and so if you can just speak about that. Okay. Okay. Um, on the second one, um, the the close questions are not the most important thing we're doing, um, and so we just wanted to keep them absolutely as simple as possible. But it may well be that in other circumstances. There may be slightly more close questions, bigger sample, fewer open-ended sections. One might change it. So um, um, it does come. I did, I did work in Peru for quite a few years on measure, measurement of well-being. And a lot of the psychometric work we did on that, we found that many of the people we were talking with, going from three to five, didn't actually add any um, precision to our research. Um, and so you get, just get that nice headline view, is it positive or negative? Um, and um, ooh, the second question, uh, the, the time period, yeah. Um, well, the specific was that because we wanted, and it didn't work very well for various reasons about you know, just detail, but we wanted to be able to compare the baseline with the end line measurement of change in each domain, particularly disposable income per adult equivalent, real disposable income. We wanted to be able to compare what we'd measured through a, a household survey with what the farmers had said. So we, we, we tried to, 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 to pin the open-ended questions to the same time period. Um, but of course, you know, this is a classic weakness of a lot of impact evaluation, is that this assumption that evaluation will have happened after one year or two years or five years. Sometimes early quips with a short recall period may be the right thing to do, because immediate impacts are expected if you're handing out seed or, 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 or doing something very specific. I mean, others are longer periods. So, you know, the one in Uganda we're doing at the moment is a five-year time period. So we spent a lot of time with the research team discussing whether that was feasible or not. And in the end, we went round the room and we all challenged ourselves to come up with something which had happened in our own lives five years ago. And actually, it took 10 minutes or so, but we all came up with something. You know, that a, a child, you know, last child had left home, um, got married, started a course, changed job. And so I think if, if um, it is important to pin it in time somehow, um, and it's about how have things changed since that date, which may be referring to one very specific thing that happened two years ago, or 
Um, so again, you know, scope for flexibility and experimentation, and of course, careful piloting of the instrument um, uh, to, to work out whether it's working or not. I'd say the instrument and the team. <laughs> for your uh, presentation. Um, one of the arguments I would say that the uh, promoters of RCTs often use is that people are generally poor judges of, of what actually is causing changes in their lives. So for example, you know, you may say your children aren't going to school because the teachers are bad or the infrastructure is poor, but actually, according to our RCT, it's because deworming didn't happen, right? So how do you take into account that you know, the quip relies on people's own perceptions of what is happening to them, but often people are wrong about, about the causality in their lives? Um, interesting question, and two answers to it. One is whether they're wrong or right, what they think matters. So if we don't engage with the perception of people we're trying to help or invest in, then we're in trouble. Um, and um, uh, secondly, I'm, I'm tempted to say that most of the time I don't think people are wrong. <laughs> um, I certainly don't think I would get through the day without trusting what people tell me a great deal. Um, the, the relatively few decisions I make in my life which are based on an RCT, and I'm still going strong um, with the evidence base that I've got. Um, so I think it's about balance. I think. Um, you know, I've read Kahneman and Sversky and, and, and I'm aware of all the cognitive traps and so on. Um, but I also think that those are attractive things for positivist researchers to research. And an awful lot of the emphasis of those is a product of the fact that it's nice to write and publish about them rather than that they are necessarily the most important things you need to be thinking about if you're evaluating certain kinds of project. So I think there's a bias. There's a deeper bias and deeper methodological, ontological, epistemological bias, which leads us to emphasize some biases over others. Yeah? Um, and of course, so, you know, we, you know, we may occasionally um, register social facts which are hiding other social facts. And I think we did detect a little bit that certainly with some farmers uh, or some respondents, once they got onto a theme, no matter which domain you were talking about, no matter how you tweaked the, the questions, it came back to the weather, you know? Uh, but, you know. So you're not getting the total truth of the farmer's sum total experience, and there is probably a bias. Um, but at least it's a bias that is coming from the person in the middle of the, the story, rather than a bias which is being slipped in there at the beginning in the way you design the RCT and which treatments you choose. So, you know, whose bias do you want? And I, you know, I, I'm quite happy to acknowledge that you know, there are dangers. But to generalize, and again, this is the problem, overgeneralization from limited data, to generalize and say, any method that takes this approach is flawed because, yeah? whereas our method is somehow bias-free, is just bonkers. Is that forceful enough? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, very interesting talk. I really enjoyed it. I should preface perhaps my comments that I'm John Main. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, I uh, as I was listening to your talk, I was thinking, gee, this sounds like a good application of contribution analysis, which, <laughs> which is what you essentially said. And I, I'm very pleased to see people that use those ideas in different ways. And I think you've introduced some interesting um, sort of some of the uh, we just your questions were on data gathering, interviewing techniques and stuff, and and how do you elicit uh, the theories of change from from the farmers using other language and like was all all very interesting. Um, I also uh, liked your I mean I obviously liked the little at the end the, the different methods that you compared to. Uh, process tracing and 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 the realist, and um, uh, you, I mean you may have seen the paper that Barbara and I did on contribution analysis and process tracing, trying to show how each could buttress each other, and I I, I really think that's uh, that's sort of where I'm working a lot these days. I think contribution analysis and realist are very similar, different words and terms, but a lot of a lot of similarities, 
And as you just as you said, you picked up smoking gun and, and, and some of the hoop test ideas uh, that each of these methods have their s particular strengths. And if we're able to sort of bring them together, we're going to get even even uh, uh, more solid and more uh, uh, credible uh, qualitative impact evaluation. And I think that's sort of what you're what you're about and doing. So I, I really enjoyed it, and I want to want to thank you very much for uh, for coming here and talking. Thank you. Thank you. I was waiting for the but. <laughs> but maybe that'll come after. <laughs> Hi, thank you a lot for your presentation. My name is Lisanne Leveille. I work at USC Canada. So we work with small scale farmers and for food security and seed security to agroecology and agrobiodiversity. But we're a really small organization. So I was wondering if um, your methods, what do you think is the size of the size of the project that should be um, used for, and um, yeah, the, have a a little bit of more um, information on the numbers. So what what kind of sampling you're working with? And I'm also aware that coding is a really <laughs> could be a really long process if you have a lot of uh, interview to to do. So just have a quick ideas of sizing. Okay. <clears throat> um, okay, so size, I mean, <clears throat> uh, I, I, I'm, I'm very interested in this idea of flexible programming and development as a response to complexity. Uh, and and, and uh, <clears throat> working with portfolios of activities which are partly experiments. Um, but that's meaningless if there isn't a mechanism for identifying which ones are working and why. Um, so behind a lot of this was how can we do something which is good enough but can be done on a small enough scale and cheap enough. Um, uh, and um, so that if you're running a challenge fund or um, a, a grant program, you can, you can um, elicit this kind of feedback from, a, from, from not necessarily from all, but from a, a, a good sample. So. Um, uh, <clears throat> I don't know how it compares, but I mean, I've worked with the, um, the, the um, some of DFID's challenge funds for NGOs, where they're giving grants of you know maybe fifty or hundred thousand uh, pounds sterling, and they will allow five percent for the evaluation at the end of the project. So five ten thousand pounds was a sort of figure in the back of my head, as what might work at that scale. Um, I think the more is well the equally interesting part of your question is how we then scale up. <clears throat> um, so the, the impact investing work in India, they're scaling up by greatly simplifying, and I haven't seen the final version of that. You know, you let a bunch of impact investors on your methodology, and, and this is, they're calling it the, the quip light. And they want to make it much smaller, they're doing it by mobile phone, and they're going for bigger samples. And, and I'd, I'd just be very interested to see what the trade-offs are that come out of, of that, because they wanted seriously bigger samples. Um, and they wanted to ration the amount of coding and, and, and not just code, coding, but you know, poking and, um, uh, and soaking that you know, good qualitative work can involve. The original thing was two people in the field, one man, one woman, for four days. If they interview two people each, um, that's four times four, 16 interviews, not a huge sample. Then they spend the fifth day doing focus groups which, which um, snowball off from the original interviews. Um, so that means you've got, as it were, 20 observations from a cluster village, um, maybe um, increasingly doing that in two clusters, contrasting contexts based on eyeballing the monitoring you get, data you've got to, to try and identify two cases where you're expecting contrasting answers. Um, that's you know that's handleable. I you know I, I can say that hopefully that will enable you to improve your priors. I can't say it'll generate statistically representative results, obviously. Um, uh, and it would be nice to get a commission where we're trying to do it on a larger scale and we can we can we can do it more representative. I have to say that doing a double quit with 46 households, um, which we did we've done twice now, um, you need a special kind of person to do the data because they should be you know, holding everything in their heads. 
um, to some extent, and 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 you know reading through before they do the the inductive coding if, if we're doing inductive coding as well. So I think you know above that number it does get difficult. But you know but on the other hand. We haven't even started to look at ways in which we can supplement the coding through, you know, text analysis, and, and, and so there's loads of things that I think we might be able to do um, to handle larger data sets if, we, if we're allowed to. Hi. Um, just a quick, again, methodological on, on the blind, you know, on the blind interviewing. Um, mm. I've done a lot of qualitative research, and I'm wondering, don't the farmers know that, I mean, it's like, even if your researcher doesn't know, I mean, people are inherently understand why is someone, and how do you explain to them why someone is going to talk to them and why you're taking up an hour or two hours of their time and why should they do it? Um, you know, it's, and, and some of the, also the ethical issues that you're not, being transparent about how your data is being used and fed back to those populations, which for Aboriginal communities in Canada is increasingly yeah. important uh, in sort of, we, and we have a whole bunch of principles around, you know, uh, or for communities in Canada where you say nothing, uh, nothing about us without us. So just in some of those issues on using the blind. Uh, okay. So two really important questions, and we're beginning to, um, yeah, take the lid off this a bit now. Um, uh, on the, on the, do the farmers know? Um, our experience has been very variable because obviously we we debrief. Well, we, we haven't debriefed as much with the farmers as we should have done, and we'd like to do more of that. But um, in some cases, you're you're working. I mean, the, the the district in North Malawi where we did one of the pilots, there were so many NGOs. You know, uh, and actually, one of the findings was the, just the confusion and the complexity of organisations that were working. Um, and um, and in in one of the Ethiopia projects in in Aramea, who were doing the malt barley, they didn't know that Technoserve and a couple of other NGOs were doing the same thing with different seed. And and again, so there was that was one of the learnings that there were a lot of already a lot of copycat organizations in doing the same thing or similar things. So in some cases, it genuinely isn't easy for the farmers to know because they're so overwhelmed with well-meaning individuals coming into the village selling them something or whatever. Um, in other cases, probably they do know or they've got a good guess, as will the researchers pretty quickly. Um, and so, uh, I mean, I think there's still mileage in thinking about um, uh, the openness of the questioning so that you're not honing in too narrowly on the things you want to find out to, to confirm you are being exploratory. Um, but obviously there are some cases where the blindfolding is not an easy option, um, even if you could overcome the ethical scruples, which is your second question. Um, I should say also, sometimes the, you, you kind of feel that the farmers are guessing, even if they don't guess right. So in Ethiopia, you'll get a tendency for people to say that everything the government did was wonderful, um, so there's a sort of bias towards the assumed author of, or commissioner of the, the research. So there's always going to be bias. It's, it's about, you know, strategies for mitigation. Um, on the ethics, um, uh, we've, we've agonized over this. And what I would like to do, um, which we didn't do in the pilot phase, is all, you know, obviously we, you know, we, we went through the standard um, ethical procedures and, and uh, identifying someone the farmers could talk to and, 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 and so on, um, and guaranteeing anon anonymity and, and those sorts of things. What I would like to do is to be able to say to the farmers that in four weeks' time there will be a meeting in place X at which we will be discussing what we found with the organization that has commissioned it, and you're welcome to attend that um, or to arrange for somebody, you know, representative. So we can, as it were, have another stage of triangulation, which is, which is open. I mean, that's the ideal. You can, so it's actually staged blind, that's why I like to say blindfolding, not blinding, yeah? And if you say, if you say look, um, I would like to interview you about the factors that have influenced your decision about where to live in Ottawa or whatever it is, um, I'm not gonna tell you who's commissioning this organization now, but 
we will share with you the findings in due course, fully transparent, then you, know, you might be more willing to go along with, with that degree of, 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 of blindfolding. Um, and so I think that's one way we, we, we could go. Uh, I have to say our field colleagues on the whole, and we were lucky in having you know, really good field staff, they were much more relaxed about this than we were. And their view was that within the, 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 the context that they were working, if they established the right relationship with the respondents, which they did, that was generally good enough. And that was about respect. It was about also, I think, in some cases, coming from um, universities which the farmers knew. Um, so there were other ways. You know, so it is culturally specific. And so I'm kind of ste stepping back a little bit from saying there is one set of ethical principles which, you know, on, on the basis of human rights should apply to every survey done everywhere, I think. And talking to Nancy Cartwright, who, um, uh, as some of you will know, is, a, is, a, is a, 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 a philosopher of science methods, I was kind of slightly reassured by how relaxed she was with the sort of utilitarian, the greater good argument in these contexts. You've got to be sure that it's worth it. Um, but, uh, but I'm pleased that you, know, you brought up the ethical issue because it, it is one that we're still grappling with. So unfortunately, our time has come to an end. But thank you so much, Dr. Kopstek, for such an engaging and thought-provoking presentation, as well as a question-answer period. And I encourage everyone to continue the discussion outside in the atrium. Um, if you missed any of our previous web, uh, webinars, or sorry, some series within our monitoring and evaluation series, please visit our website, because we do have the webcast recordings there. And before you leave, please fill out the surveys on your chairs to provide us feedback on this session. Thank you very much.